Welcome to this video that discusses multiple linear regression. This video is about variable selection, and we will start this video by discussing the problem at hand. When we were performing simple linear regression, where we only had one x, we were trying to explain the variance in the dependent variable by using a single independent variable, in this case x1. And it was very easy to assess if this variable was worthwhile having the model or not, because essentially it was our only variable. However, in the context of multiple linear regression, we have many independent variables. And now it is hard to understand which of these variables are really worth having in our models. And for instance, after analyzing the performance of each variable, we could decide that some of those are simply not worth having in our model because they are not helping us explain the variance in the dependent variable. There are two potential strategies we can use to approach the issue of selecting variables. The first one, which is fairly intuitive, is to check if each individual independent variable has a statistically significant relationship with the dependent variable, with the y. So basically, we were checking if each individual x has a positive or negative relation, but a strong relationship with the y in the model. Our second strategy will actually focus on the overall performance on the model and test how much does each individual variable contribute to the model's performance in explaining the variance of and the ability of the model to forecast unobserved values of the dependent variable. In this video, we will discuss these two strategies. Let's now describe the data we will use for the example. The data is usually available in a CSV file called auto.csv, and it has data on vehicles miles per gallon. In fact, the miles per gallon, or MPG, is going to be the continuous dependent variable in all our models. We then have a series of variables that could explain a car's performance. In particular, the number of cylinders, which is a discrete variable. Then we have displacement, which is a feature of the engine that quantifies how much liquid is displaced by the pistons of the engine. And this is a continuous variable measured in cubic inches. We then have horsepower, which is a continuous measure traditionally used to measure how strong or how potent an engine is. We then have weight of the entire vehicle measured in pounds. It's a continuous variable. Acceleration is measured in the number of seconds a car needs to reach a certain speed. We will then have the model's year, the year in which the car was manufactured. And we finally have origin, which is a discrete integer number, which is the ID of where the car comes from. Let's discuss our first strategy more in depth. As we had mentioned, it is very popular and somewhat intuitive. The key point of this strategy is to discard any independent variable that does not have a statistically significant relationship with the dependent variable. So the next question is, how do we determine if there's a statistically significant relationship? And for this, we must first ourselves decide what confidence level do we need in order to establish that there's a relationship. For example, if we determine that we want a 5% level, then we can use a factor such as the p-value and say if the p-value is higher than 5%, we will discard a particular variable. The end result of this approach is that we will have a clean model, and note the quotes on clean, where all the variables have statistically significant coefficients at least up to the 5% level. So now let's throw all the variables we have at our disposal into the model, having npg, the miles per gallon, as the dependent variable. The shown regression output shows that some variables have statistically significant relationships, however, some do not. In particular, cylinders, horsepower, and acceleration do not have small p-values. P-values of each of these are 12%, 21%, and 41%. So if we had to choose which ones to remove, we would remove all three. However, we don't want to remove all three for reasons that we will discuss in class, Rather, we want to start removing a single one, and in this case, the one with the highest p-value. So we will run our model again, this time removing acceleration. I am now showing you the model with all the previous variables, but having removed acceleration. Note that, quite interestingly, horsepower, which previously had a very high p-value, now has a low p-value, a p-value of 2.8%. So we realized that this variable might actually be worthwhile having in our model. Meanwhile, cylinders is still insignificant as it has a p-value of greater than 
we will now rerun our model having removed the cylinders variable. Once we remove cylinders, we have a new model where all the variables have p-values less than 5%. So we can say that each individual variable on its own has a statistically significant relationship with the dependent variable. And if we took the first strategy, this is the best model we can reach. However, there are several problems with this, which we discuss as follows. The underlying problem with the strategy is that we are being too strict and somewhat arbitrary in choosing which variables stay in our models. Let's remember that it was us who chose to use a 5% level to decide if a variable stayed or not. However, if you think about this objectively, there really isn't much difference between a variable that has a p-value of 5.1% versus one that could have a p-value of 4.9%. Such small difference could be due to random factors that we do not observe, and hence, using this such strict criteria could not be beneficial for us. Moreover, by dropping out the variables, we might be losing information that could be useful in explaining the variance of the dependent variable and that we could use eventually to forecast unobserved values of the dependent variable. Let's remember that regressions had two objectives. One was to establish there's a relationship between two variables, and in particular if these relationships are statistically significant, which coincides with our approach in the first strategy where we only leave in variables that have such statistically significant relationships. However, our second objective was to forecast new observations and to use what we know about the variance in the x's and its relationship to the variance of the y's to forecast new observations. So could we develop a new strategy that actually focused on a model's ability to accurately forecast unobserved values of the y's? An initial approach for this would be to focus on the r-squared. Let's remember that the r-squared is a measure of a model's fit and it captures the proportion of the variation of the dependent variable that is explained by the variation of the observed dependent variables, which are the x's and their coefficients, the betas. In other words, we could assume that the higher the r-squared, the better our model will be in forecasting any unobserved values. But is this correct? I'm going to leave you a couple of seconds for you to think if this is correct. There is a big problem in relying solely on the r-squared to establish if our model is good in explaining the variance of the dependent variable. And the problem is, regardless of how useful or useless a variable is, the r-squared can only increase as we continue adding more variables to our model. In other words, if we only use the r-squared, we could find ourselves simply throwing any single variable we find into our model, since in the worst case, our r-squared will only increase minimally. So we want to fix this metric in some way. In thinking about how could we improve the r-square as our measure, let's recall that the r-square grows whenever we add a variable that is relevant in explaining the variance in y. But on the other hand, the r-square will only grow minimally, that is only a little bit, if we add a variable that is not that relevant really in explaining the variance in y. So what we would like to have is an adjusted version of the r-squared that only grows when these new variables, these new x's, are really meaningful in explaining the variance in y. However, we would even like it to penalize us in the case we add useless variables. That is exactly the intuition behind the adjusted r-squared, which we generally denote as an r-squared with a bar on top. The adjusted r-squared is a metric that will grow with model fit, so it grows as r squared grows. However, at the same time, it decreases as the number of variables increases. So we can think of it as a function of both the r squared and the number of variables in our models. When working with the adjusted r squared, adding a new variable could even decrease its value to the point where the adjusted r squared becomes negative. This is because of the penalties of adding useless variables. The adjusted r squared will grow when we add a new variable only if that new variable does contribute to explaining the dependent variable more than what could happen just by purely random factors. So if we find that some particular variable has nothing to do with the dependent variable, but adding it increases the r-squared just by mere coincidence, by chance, by random factors, the adjusted r-squared will discover this and penalize us for this. So let's take a look again at our models. 
our first model used all the variables. And we can note that it has an R squared of 0.8214 and an adjusted R squared, which is lower than the R squared, of 0.8182. The adjusted R squared will always be lower than the standard R squared. And let me take note on the right hand side of your screen of the adjusted R squared just so we can compare it to the adjusted R squares of other models. When using the former strategy, we then removed acceleration because it was the variable with the least significant relationship with the dependent variable MPG. We note that there is a very minor improvement in the adjusted R squared in this model. The new R squared rounded up is 0.8184. So both by the first strategy and by the second one, this model is a better one. In this case, it has a higher adjusted R squared. The next step we had taken was to remove cylinders, which was the remaining variable with no statistically significant relationship with the dependent variable. And let's see what happens. Note that in this case, the adjusted R squared is 0.8177. This value is actually lower than the previous result, meaning that having cylinders into our model was not that bad after all. And cylinders, even though on its own does not appear to have a statistically significant relationship with the car's miles per gallon, it does contribute to our model's performance in being able to explain the variance of the dependent variable. We then go back to the second model and choose that since this one has the highest adjusted R squared, this is the best model we have found so far. So this video's objective was to explain to you the intuition behind the adjusted R squared and why you should use the adjusted R squared to choose what variables go into your models. However, there is still a lot of room of improvement in what we have done thus far. In particular, this example was developed in a very clumsy manner, not paying attention to many important aspects. For instance, when we ran this model, we did not even check if the different variables we used were normally distributed. It may be the case that there's a strong or positive skew in some of them, and we need to transform the variables before we can appropriately use them in our linear regression model. Similarly, we did not check if the relationships are linear. It could be the case that a car's MPG does not necessarily increase proportionally to our particular independent variables. And for many of the variables, it could be the case that having a nonlinear relationship would be more appropriate in explaining the variance of the dependent variable. Finally, we did not check that all the variables could be interpreted as numbers. In particular, if you recall when we described the variable origin, we said that this was a numerical variable that had an ID of the origin of the vehicle. And in particular, this variable took values of 1, 2, 3 to respectively indicate if this car came from the US, from Europe, or Japan. In our models, we consider this as a regular continuous variable, which in turn gives us completely erroneous results. So your job is now to fix this. I encourage you to use a visualization tool to understand how the relationships look like. An example of such tool could be Tableau. Then once you understand the relationships, you should develop the appropriate models. And once you have the models, you should use the adjusted R squared and choose the model with the highest adjusted R squared as your best model. Thank you very much.